I'd like to begin in chapter 1, verse 1, as you know of a book and preach or teach my way through it. This morning we'll talk about some understanding and some people being unfocused and some unbelieving folks out there. I think some people, as they read Scripture, especially this little short passage we read this morning, have the mistaken idea that John was constantly writing down what was going on. Like he was the recording secretary of the disciples and that they say him with a little notebook and taking notes. Well, that didn't happen. It was many years later that John wrote his gospel account. Many people say, well, how, how in the world could he do that? Well, Jesus had told them that when the Holy Spirit came, he would bring everything to their remembrance. So he, he's not going to forget what happened. Had he just been a man without the influence of the Holy Spirit, he would have been like we, we are today. And we forget things. Over a period of time, you forget. The things you want to forget, you tend to remember. The things you want to remember, you tend to forget. But the Holy Spirit brought everything to mind for John as he wrote this down. And I only mention this fact because John admits there in verse 16 that at the time these events took place, that entry into Jerusalem, the sound of Hosanna, everything that's going on, and he's actually going farther in his thinking here. He's talking about the crucifixion and all that. They didn't understand it. They didn't know what Jesus was doing when he came in to Jerusalem. These events not only include Jesus' entry, as I said, but leading up to the, the death on the cross and the resurrection, they didn't understand these things. As a matter of fact, it appears that none of the disciples understood it. Remember when Jesus was trying to explain to his disciples that he had to give up his life, Peter said, oh no, no, that couldn't happen. Get thee behind me, Satan. They didn't understand. None of the disciples could comprehend the least thought of Jesus dying. Even though they've been with him for three, three and a half years now, these men couldn't understand until after the death and the resurrection. See, John tells us, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him. And I can understand that. A lot of things are going to become clear to them at that moment when Jesus comes to them in the upper room through that locked door and says, Shalom, peace. Their eyes were opened. So many things then, and then when the Holy Spirit came, everything became clear to them. But see, it takes the Holy Spirit to open the eyes of, to the things of the Lord for anyone. So it's virtually important though, vitally important, for every believer to do one thing, and that is to read and study the Bible continually every day. You see, those disciples walked with Jesus all those years. They heard him face to face. They heard his voice. We cannot sit that way, but we still have the voice of Jesus right before us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became, was made flesh and dwelt among us. We're hearing from God. We're hearing from Jesus Christ. And if you can only walk close to Jesus, if you stay close to Him, you have to stay close to His Word. There are two important points that we, as believers, need to ponder. First, we don't always understand the things of Scripture at first glance. Never stop at first glance. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, see, there's two things you can do. If you don't understand it, you can push it aside or you can start to do a little research. You continue to read, you continue to study, you call your pastor, you call a friend, you discuss it. And the second problem that we have, we can forget what the Bible says. You know, I found as I get older, yeah, I'm getting older, I tend to forget things. It's normal. It, it comes with the territory. I'll get, off, get out of my office and I'll walk to the kitchen and I can't remember why I went in the kitchen until I go back and sit down at the desk. I want to get a drink. That's the way we are now. You see, you, the major difference in forgetting because of age and what you forget in the Bible is because 
you stopped studying. You stopped reading. You forget the things of the Bible because it's been too long since you read and studied the Bible. I'm going to say this again for I don't know how many, how many times I've said it. We live in a lazy world today. By that I mean the people of the world tend to be lazy. We live in a world of convenience. Everything is good. How quick can I get in? How fast can I do this? I don't have, want to go in the drive through for this, the drive through for that. Everything's made as simple and as quick as possible. With all of its time saving and labor saving methods and machinery, things are not getting any better, are they? Really not. If I had one thing that, I, Lord said, Melvin, you can change one thing in this technology, you know what I would change? The cell phone. You know, you, people, they spend so much time on the phone, they do not actually communicate with anyone. Well, look, what's the phone for? Communication. Have you ever watched a family at a restaurant? There'd be six kids, mom and dad, and they're all on the phone. I would like to go back to the old days when you had a phone in the house, and if you weren't at home, you just missed a call. Because, and when you wanted to talk to somebody, what did you do? You talked to them. And you see, we live in a world today, because of the cell phone, people don't talk to the Lord. But you know, the Lord doesn't accept emails. He still accepts email. Talk to the Lord. Things are simple, yes, but the world yells that our time is far too valuable to spend it reading the Bible or going to church services. Isn't that what the world yells at you? Oh, there's so many things to do. And when you do have free time, what does the devil say? Oh, there's too much fun out there in the world to get, you know, to waste it like that. You don't need to go sit in that pew and have some preacher yell at you that you're a sinner when you can go out here and have fun at the ballpark. Hmm. You know, that is a huge lie that the world has accepted. You know, that lie tells us that to, to sin, it's easier to sin and to follow temptation than to be told about sin. It's fun to sin, the world tells you. You know, the, the world has taken a big eraser and, and they'll take their, and they try to erase what God says. Well, that's not what it means. Pleasure and entertainment have taken place, taken the place of serious study of God's word and dedication to the Lord. I certainly know the world's a busy place, and I know that it beckons us to come and get involved in the things of the world to the exclusion of Bible study, and that's what we so desperately need. You see, the devil knows that if he can keep us away from the Word of God, he wins. The Word of God is our instruction book. I know it seems like I harp on this Bible study so much, but it's so important. Like anything else, though, if you don't use it, you will lose it. Think back to one of you, some class you took in high school. Yeah, physics. How much do you remember from physics class? You haven't used it for years, you forgot it. Same thing with the Bible. I've met many, many people, including my own family, who have been out of church for so long and they never read their Bible anymore. They've forgotten the most basic portions of Scripture. It sets to the, you know, the point where it gets to the point where it's so easy to be taken in by the lies of evolution and false doctrine because you have no defense. You forgot. I can talk to my family about the most basic things and they'll say, what? You talk about creation and they don't know. My nine-year-old great-nephew knows more of the Bible now than most of my family. That's sad. And it's all because they don't want to give up any moments. They don't want to give Christ what belongs to Him. They want to stay in the world. But without the Word of God in your heart and following the instructions of Scripture in your daily walk, you're walking in darkness. I always remember the Bible is, what the Bible is. Psalm 119.05 The Word is a lamp unto my feet 
and a light into my path. I guess you could say today, in our language, you're going to put it, bring it from old English to ours. It's clear enough anyway, but it would say, the Word of God is the headlight which illuminates my walk in this world. People would understand that right away. And you need desperately that light because this is a dark, dark world. You know, if you drive at night and you don't turn on your headlights, and I see people do this all the time, they drive without headlights. You know, you're going to have a problem. Most likely you're going to have an accident. You're going to drive into a ditch or something. Well, let me tell you something you already know. As we walk through this world, there are many deep potholes out there. And your path, if it's not illuminated by the Word of God, you're going to fall in that path, that pothole, and you're going to injure yourself. Now, if you're a believer, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you sure are going to be stumbling in that sinkhole, and you're going to lose a great deal of your Christian enjoyment, and you're going to lose out on your fellowship with Jesus Christ, and you're going to damage your witness. Nothing good comes out of wandering around in the darkness. When you walk around like a member of the world, that's all the lost see. They see you just as they are, wandering around in darkness. And they say, you know, if that's a Christian, <laughs> there's nothing that pulls me to them. They're just like I am. They look like they're enjoying living in sin and enjoying the pleasures of, this, of sin for a short season. Your witness is going to be a witness one way or the other. Did you know that? As a Christian, your witness is either a good witness for Jesus Christ or a bad witness. And if it's a bad witness, you're witnessing, witnessing for the devil. And I mean, people realize that too. So our study of the Bible leads us to what John has already told us. And I mentioned the Word, Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We know the Bible, which you hold in your hand or sitting on your lap this morning, is Jesus speaking directly to you. The Bible's personal. I know that you say, well, this... This was written to this group of believers here. Or this, this was written to... It's written to you. Did you know that? When you read the Bible, God is speaking to you. Listen to Jesus. He's talking to you. You know, John 8, 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So there's only one way for the Christian to walk in the light and that's by studying the Bible. And in prayer, asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten the Word before you read it. That's a problem with so many people. They pick up the Bible and they start to read and they miss so much. You need the Holy Spirit to enlighten the Word for you. Here again, there's the light. And you, if you ask Him to come in and enlighten that Word for you, the words will jump off the page. I don't care if it's a passage you've read a hundred times, you will see something new. Something new will come to your heart and you'll say, wow, this Word is alive. It's the Holy Spirit who opens your eyes to the truth. It's the Holy Spirit who gives you the understanding of Scriptures. And it's the Holy Spirit that leads the path to the Savior. If you didn't have the Bible, if we did not have the Bible, no one in this room would be saved. Did you know that? If we didn't have the Bible, we would have no knowledge of the gospel. There would be no preachers telling you about the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'd be walking around as dead men. If you truly want to understand Scripture, you must have a heart and a desire to read and study the Bible every single day. Where's your heart today? That's a good question. Where's your heart? Is it in the world or is it with the Savior? If it's in the world, your Bible's going to be dusty. You ever gone to someone's house and have that big Bible sitting on the coffee table? Take a good look at it when you go in. Is it dusty? A dusty Bible does you no good. I think I've mentioned, well, I used to walk through parking lots. I don't walk as much as I used to because of bad legs, but... I would see a Bible in the back of a car and that back window and the, it's curled up 
because of the sun. That's an unused Bible. Where's your heart? If your heart is with Jesus, you want to fellowship with Jesus. Only one, and that's the way you do it in prayer and in Bible study. So when Jesus entered Jerusalem, there were many people. They were curious about him. Verse 17 says, For this cause the people also met him, for they had heard that he had done this miracle. 2,000 years ago, people had heard about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? You say, what's amazing about it? No radio, no TV, no computers, no newspapers, no post. And they heard about Jesus? Somebody is talking. They're doing what we're supposed to be doing today, witnessing about Jesus Christ, telling others about it. No, you know, we, today we cannot go and see Jesus. We can't do that personally. But I want you to have no fear. He's right here this morning. If we had the ability to open our spiritual eyes, you could see Jesus. He's, the, he's here. Two or three are gathered together. He's sitting next to you. There are angels here and there are demons here. They're here this morning. If you or anyone for that matter is curious about Jesus, there's an abundance of information about Him and it's found in the Bible. And it, you know what? What you find in your Bible about Jesus is a speck. Just a speck. You know, John tells us later, if everything Jesus said and did, the books of the world couldn't hold it. We only see a, a glimpse of Jesus. So if you or anyone else for that matter is curious, you can find him in the pages of the Bible. See, those people 2,000 years ago were curious because of a miracle. Some people are going to ask what miracle, but we've already been told before here, they're thinking about Lazarus being raised from the grave, but Jesus performed many miracles. The one that caught their attention in this case was Lazarus, and there's still people talking about Jesus healing the blind man who was blind from birth. But the word from Bethany had come just, just a week or so before. Many people were still witnessing. They were still talking about that great event where Jesus called Lazarus back from the tomb. And it caused quite a stir in Jerusalem. Bethany is only two miles away. But there's a great stir in the city. Every miracle in Scripture that's recorded touches people in different ways. Think about it. Have you ever thought about that? As you read about the miracles of Jesus, does it, one miracle maybe grab you more than another because of some weakness or, or need in your life? The blind receiving their sight, that would cause you know, excitement in a physically blind person. My grandfather, I never knew him. He died a year before I was born, was blind. He sees this morning. And one day... He'll see my face. But just reading that passage, he was like, Jesus heals the blind. It would be encouraging for some believers knowing that their sight could be restored at any moment if it's the will of God. Boy, it gives them daily hope, doesn't it? But even if their sight is not returned and they have faith in the Lord, they know one day they're going to see. And the first thing they'll see is the face of Jesus. How would you like that to be the first thing you ever saw in your life? I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to see colors and beauty that we can't even imagine here. You know, fall will be here in a few months and our mountains will explode with colors. It's nothing to what we're going to see when we get to heaven. You know, Jesus healed many people of many different illnesses. And it gives all of us hope when we're ill, that the great physician can touch us. I want to tell you, he's touched me on many occasions. And I'm still here. How many times has he healed you? How many times did you thank him for healing you? How many times did you thank the doctor and didn't thank Jesus? The doctor sent you the bill. Jesus did the healing. We need to remember that. And if the healing... You know, if the healing doesn't come, <clears throat> that's the will of the Lord. But we're going to live eternally as a believer. And you'll never hear that word again. 
No doctors, you'll never hear that. No hospitals, no rescue squads. Sorry, Donnie, no rescue squads needed. No undertakers, no funeral homes. The word death will never be heard again. These things give us encouragement to know what the Lord does. Yeah, every miracle of the Lord causes us to rejoice in His love, His power, His sovereignty, and His grace. But not everyone is curious about Jesus, and certainly not everyone loves Jesus. Those who hate the Lord never change. And I'll tell you something, there's always opposition to Jesus. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the whole world has gone after him. I'll tell you what, I wish that had been a true statement. Oh, the whole world is gone after him. This world would be different if that statement were true. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You know, man has spent century after century after century in an attempt to find <clears throat> ways to bring peace into this world and understanding into this world. And yet, hate runs rampant all over the place. It runs unchecked. But if the whole world went after Jesus, if the whole world would come to salvation, this world would be a place that would be unrecognizable to us. It would be so different and it would be such a wonderful place. But it was not the case 2,000 years ago. And today, most of the world still rejects Jesus Christ. They reject Jesus and they follow the devil willingly. Now you can find any religion you desire, but if you're not following Jesus, if you're not a born again believer, you're following the devil. What did he say? I'll say it again. You can follow any religion. Christianity is not a religion. Religion is man trying to work his way to God. Christianity is God reaching down to man. You can belong to any religion you want to, any cult, whatever. If you're not a born again believer in Jesus Christ, you're following the devil. I'll tell you. You know, when you gather those who are for Jesus and those who oppose him, you have an explosive situation on your hands. And that's what happened in Jerusalem that week, an explosion. You see, we have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there are two different problems. The first problem has to do with the crowd of people. The crowd was enthusiastic about Jesus' miracle. Did you notice what John said? They were out of cure. It's the miracles of Jesus. That's why they're enthusiastic. Their problem is that their interest was centered on Lazarus and that resurrection and not on the person of Jesus Christ. If you're focused in the wrong direction, you're in trouble. That's the major problem today. Far too many people are focusing on other things rather than Jesus Christ. What do people focus on today? Think about it. They're, they're focused on their bank account, they're focused on getting this done, that done, when can I buy this, when I can I do that? But they're not, they don't focus on Jesus. You see, people are just far too busy discussing what Jesus has done rather than why he performed the miracles that he did. In short, they have head knowledge, but no heart knowledge. There are a great number of people who know the Bible but don't know Jesus. They know all about Jesus, but they don't know him personally. Jesus performed miracles so that we can clearly see who Jesus is, and that should point us to the free salvation he offers. Notice I said who Jesus is because he always has been, he is, and always will be the great I am. The focus of our attention needs to be on Jesus Christ. When we focus on Jesus, we'll be focusing on his teaching in which he yeah, takes us in turn to his sacrificial death and his glorious resurrection. Our focus needs to be on the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. 
We need to focus on the one who died for us while we were yet sinners. That's Jesus Christ. No, never forget the miracles he performed. Don't do that. But you need to remember why Jesus performed those miracles to show us who he is and why he came to this earth. It's time to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Keep focusing where it belongs on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we come to the second problem. The second problem, the unbelievers. The unbelieving Pharisees wanted to kill Jesus. They've wanted to do that for some time. They've been at war with him since day one. He is that true Jesus has outsmarted them at every turn. No matter what the argument, Jesus wins it. But then again, how do you argue with God? And how can you win over God? But the problem is, they didn't believe the word. They didn't believe who Jesus was. And so they think he's just a man. But not only were the Pharisees wanting to kill Jesus, there were a majority of people, as we see in Jesus' day, at his crucifixion, who also wanted to see him dead. Now, I don't know if this will shock you or not, but you know what? That's still the desire of people today, to see Jesus dead. The world, and when I say world, I'm referring to any time to unbelievers, and the world wants to see Jesus dead and in the grave. That's what the world wants. They want Jesus to stay in that tomb. Or some people want him to stay on the cross. You ever seen a crucifix? Jesus on the cross? That's unfinished work. That cross is empty. The tomb is unoccupied because we have a Savior who lives forever. Understand, Satan wants Jesus dead. Satan wants Jesus' work of salvation unfinished. That old serpent can convince people that Jesus is dead, then they will not be saved. And the dead can save no one. That's what Satan wants. He wants to convince, and he's doing a great job. <clears throat> he says, if Jesus is still in the tomb, there's no hope. And remember, the devil will lie. He's the father of lies. And he gives people false hope, which is no hope at all. Satan will offer you many ways to salvation. From works to the promise of there is no hell. And then he'll say, well, all good people go to heaven. They're all lies from the pit. And sadly, I want to tell you something. His lies have worked. People have fallen for the same lie of Satan since Eden. And they continue to accept it today. I know you're probably thinking, well, how in the world can, can the world today kill Jesus and keep him in the grave? Well, you know, it can't be done. It can't be. He's, he rose. But they can still do it in theory. One of the, devil, one of the things the devil has done such a powerful job of is convincing the world that Jesus was a wonderful teacher, and he was. Oh, he was a great religious leader, and he was. But at the same time, Satan says, he's only a man. He's always only a man. Well, he was totally a man, but he was totally God. Remember, as I said, the devil is the father of lies. The devil mixes in just enough truth with a whole lot of lies, and the result is confusion, and confusion does not come from the Lord. We have Our God is a God of order. Remember that. If you don't believe me, just look at creation. The first day He did this, the second day He did it, it's order. Jesus, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They rejected it. My time has not yet come. He is a God of order. The arrest, the trial, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, the rapture of the church is coming, the second coming of the Lord after the tribulation, a God of order. The lie that Jesus is still dead has been spoken from the very first day that Jesus arose from the grave. It's not anything new. Right after the resurrection, the guards were bribed to say, the disciples stole the body of Christ. 
John, Matthew 28, 11 says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch, that's the guards, came to the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. These guards should have been powerful witnesses to the chief priests. You know, they weren't followers of Jesus. They were pagans. You know, and they saw something beyond human power. And they reported it. Along with all the other things the Pharisees, all those religious leaders should have seen and heard about Jesus, they knew the miracles were true. And now they have these pagans coming and saying what happened on that resurrection Sunday, but they wouldn't believe. They would not believe. Their hatred is too strong. They rejected it. Their hearts were shut up from the truth. They didn't want to hear it. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye his disciples came by night, stole him away while he slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. And they took the money and did as they were told. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. They bribed those guards to be quiet. Oh my. Keep the truth quiet. You know what? People are still being bribed today not to tell the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They are. I know you think, how, how can I be bribed to keep my mouth shut? Well, think about it. When you find yourself in a group of people who are hostile against the Lord, do you tend to remain silent? Well, you were just bribed. You were bribed to remain silent so you could stay with that group of people. You wanted to stay there, so you, you became quiet. When Sunday morning rolls around, and you've made plans to go out to a ball game or picnic or other activity with friends, you were just bribed. You went with the flow of the world, so you kept quiet and you stayed at home away from church or some activity. It's easy to be bribed into keeping the gospel silent, even today. Well, Christian, let me tell you something. Jesus forgives you for that just like He has everything else. He's forgiven you of your sins. Does it grieve Him? Absolutely. Does He forgive you? Yes. And when you think about that, it should make you bolder in your witness because you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. You don't want to grieve Jesus Christ. But Jesus' love and salvation does not give you license to sin and it doesn't give you license to remain silent when you have the opportunity to tell others the truth of the gospel message. You know, we're encouraged by the words of Scripture. For example, Proverbs 28.1 tells us, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. The wicked flee. Well, Christians, we are not to flee because we are saved and therefore we are righteous in the eyes of God. Jesus' righteousness is with us and so we are to be bold as a lion. Don't flee. Be bold in Jesus Christ. I know it's not easy, but Paul tells us over in Romans 8.31, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Christians, there it is. If God be for us, who can be against us? It's a rhetorical question. Nobody can. Nobody can stand against us. They might attack us. They might take our life, even though they don't realize our life's in God's hands. We're with God. The world may attack, but our eternity is secure. We belong to the family of God, and He will take care of you now, and He's going to take care of you forever. 2,000 years ago, Jerusalem was crowded for the Feast of Passover. Today, the people seem to be, you know, busting at the seams of this world. They're crowded. People talk about how crowded we are, but yet you take a ride and there's a lot of land and different things, but we're crowded today. And today, just as it was then, some people are curious about Jesus. Some people are indifferent. Some people anticipate Jesus' arrival soon, and some, if not most, are plotting to get rid of Him. I've heard some people say that 
Jesus could have had the crown before without going to the cross. He could have been king without going to the cross when he was king. Those people, though, that say that need to think about something. <clears throat> you see, they're like Peter. They don't understand about the crucifixion. If Jesus had not gone to the cross, had he gone directly to become king, wearing that crown, if he were ruler today, we would have a great problem. What kind of problem could we have if Jesus is king of kings ruling? It's a huge problem. If Jesus never went to the cross for us, if he never took our sins for us, never went to the grave for us and rose again, we'd be lost. There's no way of salvation. See, Jesus willingly went to the cross so that we could be saved. There's no other way to be saved. You can't make it up. You can't do it your own way. If Jesus had not gone to the cross as a sacrifice for our sins, we would be carrying those sins on our shoulders this very moment. And what a huge and heavy burden that would be. You see, that's how much Jesus loved us. He took our punishment. He took our death. He took our grave. He took our sins upon Himself so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ. There was a brief moment of triumph that day in Jerusalem before Jesus' death. But it is not what we call the triumphal entry. There's going to be a glorious time in the future when there will be a triumphal entry when the Lord comes back and we're going to come back with Him. Have the sheep and goat judgments and we're going into the kingdom where everyone is saved. Every person that goes in their physical bodies in the kingdom will be saved. But there's a problem. Their children have to be saved. And children sometimes rebel. And we know that they do because at the end of the kingdom, what happens? It's a rebellion. And then we step into eternity. But that is the triumphal entry of the Lord. You know, one of my favorite paintings of the crucifixion shows three crosses up on a hill. The bodies of those three crucified men are, have been taken down. They're laying in the tombs now. Now, in the background, people don't pay a lot of attention to this. In the background of those three crosses, there's a little donkey. He's eating palm branches. What a mess. That's a great sermon in that little painting there. Those discarded palm branches and the cross are simply tokens of Jesus' so-called triumphal entry. You know, the crowd said, Hosanna, blessed be the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. That same crowd yelled, crucify Him later that week. At that point, the crowd is, the crowd is gone. Jesus is in the tomb. If we look at that painting, Jesus offered himself publicly as their king. They rejected. But Jesus didn't stay in that tomb. He lives and lives forever. Now look at that donkey. What's he doing? He's eating the palm branches that are left behind from that triumphal entry. He's cleaning up the mess. The donkey Jesus rode in on. The cross that never has to be used again. What a picture! The only thing missing to me would if he would have put a tomb with a stone rolled away next to it. But isn't it a beautiful picture? The cross is empty. The tomb is unoccupied. Jesus is alive. He lives and He lives forever. Jesus saves. May we pray. Father, this is our invitation time now. Jesus saves. I guess that is a sermon in itself, Lord. But as we listen to the crowd, how fickle they are. And we see men's hearts are so hard. Hatred has overtaken their entire life. And yet, while you were on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's love beyond comprehension. 
Father, I'm praying this morning that whatever the needs are this, this week, the day, whatever that the Holy Spirit is working in hearts, I know that there are a lot of things that are happening this week that are going to be pressing on hearts. I pray for James and the surgery, Lord. I pray that you're right now working with that surgeon to know exactly what to do. And I know that you're going to heal. Father, I know that there are worries and hurts, family problems, and we need to turn them over to you. And I'm asking now also, Father, the Holy Spirit convicts each heart here this morning to not only spend more time in prayer, but in reading and studying the Word of God and spending more time in church services. Father, be with those of our church family that couldn't be with us this morning due to illness or work. Bless them, keep them, and return them to us. And I thank you for the salvation you so freely given. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.